Welcome to Speaking of AI, where LXT's Phil Hall discusses current trends in AI with leading experts. Hello and welcome. Uh, my guest today is an electrical engineer, a speech scientist, and an industry veteran, a true industry veteran. When I read his list of employers, it's like laying out a roadmap for the contemporary history of speech recognition and AI. Bell Labs, AT&T, Speechworks, ScanSoft, IBM, SpeechCycle, Jibo, Google. And in addition to his current job as chief scientist at Unifor, he's a talented and successful author, photographer, and musician. It gives me enormous pleasure to welcome as our guest today, Roberto Piracini. Uh, hello and welcome, Thank Roberto. Thanks so much, Phil. I know we have been talking for a while about uh, this uh, podcast, and I'm glad we made it happen. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Uh, oh, it's great to have you here. So, um, Roberto, you've published two wonderfully informative and accessible books on the evolution of AI. 2012's Voice in the Machine and 2021's um, AI Assistance. I don't imagine that at the time of their publication, you could have foreseen that they would roughly coincide with two of the biggest landmarks in the technology's progress. That is, in 2011, Siri's full integration into the iPhone, which really did change things for speech recognition, I believe. And then... Um, in 2022, the public release of ChatGPT. So looking at Siri and its uh, integration into the iPhone, when it was already apparent that Siri would be impactful and relevant, you asked some great questions, but ultimately left them unanswered. So I'd love to hear how you would respond to your own questions today. From your perspective, was Siri a beginning or an end? And was Siri what the scientists of the field hoped for to recover from all the frustration and unpopularity that speech recognition's small and big earlier failures had raised in the popular culture? Thanks, Siri. That's a great question. As a matter of fact, when Siri came out, I think it was October 4, 2011, exactly one day before, unfortunately, Steve Jobs passed away, I was in a hotel in Melbourne, in your country. So, ah. <laughs> yes, uh, it was a time we were, we were actually working. It was a speech, speech cycle, and we were working with uh, Tesla, uh, the, 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 ah. the, the uh, Australian large uh, uh, telco, telecommunication company. And then I, I learned, I, I knew Siri, because Siri came out as an app, independent app on iPhone, one year earlier than that, one or two years earlier than that, and I was trying, I was mesmerized by Siri. And then I heard that it was uh, coming out soon on iPhone 4S, if I'm uh, correct. Mm -hmm. And then I, my, the proofs of my book were already at the, at the, uh, at the publisher, MIT Press. I, I already sent them the final manuscript. I said, I cannot publish a book without a chapter on Siri. So I remember in that hotel room, very quickly I wrote the last chapter, which is called uh, Siri, What's the Meaning of Life? And the, the publisher liked it and we inserted that. So the question that Siri was the beginning and end was both, right? Siri was the end of a, a, a decades of frustration and spiritual recognition for many reasons. You know, technology was not quite there. We worked for... I started working in speech recognition in, in 1980, but you know, speech recognition started earlier than that, as you know. And the, uh, uh, we, we were moving ahead, and there's all this, you know, uh, make people making fun, speech recognition doesn't work. And the problem was that uh, the, the world knew about speech recognition through the what they call IVR, you know, interactive voice response application that uh, somehow simulate uh, contact center agents. And there were a lot of issues at the time. So first of all, people called agents when something was wrong. So they were not in the best of uh, mm -hmm. mood, right? You know, your check bounced, the appliance you bought doesn't work, your TV doesn't work. And so 
And then instead of talking to a human, they talk to a machine that who the machine did not always recognize them and, and so on. So Siri, I'd say, was the end of that time, or the time is continuing today, right? It is still used a lot. We talk probably a little bit about that later. But uh, uh, Siri opened up the, the technology of speech recognition to the whole world in a totally different manner. And it was for, you know, people were not captive on application. They didn't want to talk to. Talk to. People could choose freely to use Siri for many things. Mm-hmm. And people started using it in a more unusual way, asking, where can I bury a body? I remember for at a time it was one of the most popular questions, ask uh, mm-hmm. Siri, but also other things like set an alarm and other type of things, right? So that was the, uh, uh, the, the, the good thing, a good thing, right? Now, the problem uh, was that it was very hard to know the limits of the vocal assistant, the, the voice assistant. Can I ask anything? Can I ask anything uh, in the way I want, in any possible way, with any possible, with any possible accent, in any possible noise situation? And the answer was no. And it was very hard to understand the limits, right? What I can ask and mm-hmm. what I cannot ask. And the second uh, point, uh, uh, what are the capabilities? Can I ask? to plan my next vacation? Can I ask it to, uh, uh, to tell me what was that nice restaurant in Paris where I went three years ago, no, maybe it was four years ago with my wife and I had uh, uh, onion soup, right? Yeah. These are actually, <laughs> yeah. we are laughing about that, you know, except the onion soup. You know, if you use Google Maps, Google Maps knows pretty much the restaurant you went in, to in Paris three or four years ago, right? So in principle, you could answer this question, but not at that time, not at that time. So, so it, it was the beginning of a new era, the era of the, uh, of the uh, automated assistant or voice assistants, or I, as I call them in my second book, AI assistants. And then in fact, immediately after a few years, uh, Alexa came out, uh, Google uh, Assistant came out and Samsung Bixby came out. I think the, so, so that's what I consider it, epochal thing it was a change of of uh, scenario for speech recognition yeah absolutely um i i and i i it is quite remarkable today with uh, multiple choices you know i if i'm sitting in my lounge room um i can actually call out any of those names and uh they're they're there and ready to help so um the big question uh, in your books, you often made reference to Hal, the personal assistant um, in uh, um, space, uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, in fact, in the end, the villain in uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. So the question you asked, uh, in your opinion, did Siri turn out to be the gentler version of Hal that we've been waiting for for more than 60 years? Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, when I started, when I was in, in high school, uh, uh, I went to see uh, Kubrick's uh, uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. That was one, one of the things that really impressed me, uh, along with the, uh, the moon landing, right? So that, uh, and I, I, I want to be an engineer. This is great. It's so cool, right? You know, and then I, by chance, ended up in speech recognition. I was always dreaming, can we build? a gentle version hall, you know, not a villain version, but a gentle version. And I would say that comparing City with Hal is a little bit of a stretch, right? You know, if you, if you watch 2001 uh, Space Odyssey again, you'll see that Hal has incredible capability. Even today, we cannot do, even with the, the latest child GPT and large language models. There is a, there is a, there is a scene where uh, Dave, the astronaut, is drawing something on a sketchbook. I know it was very boring life on the Discovery because mm. everyone else was hibernated. There's, there's no one to talk to or very few people to talk to. And uh, he was sketching the faces of, of, of his uh, colleagues who were hibernated. And then he shows it to her. I ask, what are you doing Dave? They say, I'm sketching. They say, uh, nice rendering. He improved a lot in the past couple of months. Uh, 
that's uh, can you make it can you put can you put it closer and they put it closer to the camera and say uh that's dr hunter isn't isn't it yeah, that's amazing right yeah mm. you yeah. cannot uh and also the level of, of emotion like uh when they play chess of course how cheats at a certain point yeah, it's cheating right it's calling a move but it's making another move right uh and uh <laughs> so if you if you if you look at carefully at the, at the chessboard it will, but then it say thank you for an, for an enjoyable game which is amazing right of course you can record that it could be canned right but mm-hmm. the, the level of expression the level of things it's, it looks like no well, we are far from there right you know uh, whether we're going to get to something like how I, I i don't know uh but uh today is a little bit of a stretch i don't think we are quite there and whether we will or we want to be <laughs> something like that so we want to be, to build something like that yeah uh, yeah i mean um there's been a lot written in the last um yeah since launch of chat gpt um which really awakened public consciousness of ai potential um generative ai potential in particular right. um that I mean, how how concerned are you about the uh villain potential if you like yeah of course being deep into that technology i'm concerned but not i'm not concerned for the you know the doom day when ai will uh imprison or will put an end to the human race you know i uh, or human species I, I don't think so. I'm not afraid of that. What I'm afraid about the use of AI for uh, by by villains, by human world villains, right? Mm. For doing things that uh, that can cause a, a disaster. Imagine interrupting the the electrical power for days, and imagine uh, in you know getting to the banks and using your money or. So these these are a real thing that could happen. So, like if you remember when we had virus, I don't know, we, we didn't hear about about viruses anymore. It said COVID, right? But uh, the computer viruses, but it was a mm. continuous fight between the virus detectors and all the virus that runs on your PC and the virus. And every time there was a new virus, the virus detector came came up with new solution. And I think that's our future, right? Uh, mm. We we'll see. Uh, we need to create uh, measures and guidelines and guard rays. It could be uh, legal gu- guidelines and guard, uh, technology guard rays that prevent anything bad happen. That's why everyone, including myself, is talking about responsible AI, right? We, mm-hmm. we, we build AI. We need to be very responsible about what we build. And, and, and that, that's, that's all the companies in the world are really on the same line. Of course, like in every case, the good people are on that, uh, thinking that way. What we need to, to, to fear about is the people who are not as good as that, right? They want to do evil with that. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. Uh, thanks for that. That's a, uh, I think, I think people will find that answer quite reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I Which hope so. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So let me bounce back to the beginning of the 1990s. Um, At that point, I think the way I saw it anyway is that the value proposition for speech technology was evident, but not particularly compelling. Up until the point where Jay Wilpon and AT&T released the first meaningful voice automation system at scale. Now, in your book, you um, referred to this and you said that... um, there was a significant financial investment needed to uh, support the emerging technology so it fulfills potential. So it was hardly surprising if at that time you could measure success in terms of the number of humans that can be replaced, for example. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so um, you, you showed that uh, a simple five-phrase uh, application enabled 6,000 layoffs. Okay. Um, yeah. So that makes a financial a compelling financial case which perhaps didn't exist before that event yeah. um, and then later in the 90s um, 
Uh, I love the phrase that there was a shift from carbon-based transcription to silicon-based. <laughs> Did I say that? So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, it, um, yeah, so it doesn't really surprise me that at that time when people were trying to make a compelling case, trying to get the financial support that they needed, that they would make their case very strongly in financial terms, okay? This, these are the savings we can make. So give us the money and we'll make those savings for you. Yeah. Um, how would you characterize the contemporary value of AI systems, perhaps yeah. from a user perspective and then from a commercial perspective? Thanks. This is a very, very good question. Uh, first of all, uh, you mentioned Jay, Jay Wilpon, who is a great friend of mine. We are, uh, we are born the same year. We all this ah. love seeing each other. And if he listens to this podcast, I say hello to Jay. Uh, uh, he, as, as a matter of fact, the six, AT&T guaranteed me, or Jay guaranteed me, that uh, the 6,000 layoff never happened, but AT&T found a way. So I was, I don't know if that's true or not, <laughs> right? But I was reassured that, that they, and was, Jay was working on this technology probably one or two years before I joined AT&T Bell Labs. Uh, but it's always the case. If you look at the history, the most evident case is the invention of the of the uh, assembly line by Ford in 1913, mm. I think. Uh, that displaced a lot of people, right? And uh, and any new technology does that. Uh, you know, and we need to be the whole society and the whole system needs to be aware of that and needs to provide help for people who are displayed. People need to be trained on different jobs and different uh, uh, careers. And uh, so that's a responsibility that we have as a society, right? But we cannot stop the, uh, the, uh, the, the progress of technology, right? Otherwise today we still use horses, right? Mm -hmm. And not uh, Teslas to go to work, right? Yeah. So talking about this particular technology, the reason why it came out in the mid nineties or the early nineties, because if you remember before there was the, what's called DTMF, press one mm -hmm. for this press two, and then voice recognition in the mid nineties, thanks to speech works and nuance became, at least in the US, became very uh, reasonably uh, accurate. And we started using that. And the reason is not just to lay off people to save money, but because if you look at the consequence of, of the spending necessary for an enterprise to maintain a trained uh, task force in the, for, for customer care is huge. And what, what, what happened, the agents were poorly trained. So they, provided, they didn't provide much value to the end customer. And since you don't have infinite, uh, uh, an infinite number of agents, responding to the demand of an increasingly amount of customers. Customers will end up waiting in a queue with music for uh, tens of minutes or half hours or more. And it's not the best uh, of uh, use of their time. So the idea to automate part of that and to always provide a way to escalate to a, to a human agent when, this, when the problem was hard to solve for the machine, uh, had a sense it was not just for saving money, but also for providing a better customer care. So today, uh, I, am, I am back to that after Google, after Jibo, and uh, I work at a company called Unifor that where that is one of the many value proposition that we provide. So uh, what we call self-serve, right? So building applications that uh, uh, somehow uh, automate certain functions, not all of them, certain function of, of agent. Actually, there are more interesting applications than that where AI is helping. One is the agent assist. I told you that it's hard to train agents and there is a big turnover and attrition in the, uh, among the agent. So uh, talking to an agent who is not trained doesn't really help, right? You know, so uh, AI can provide support to, to, to agent, tell them what is the next thing to do give them answer uh, from, the, from the knowledge base that the user is asking. So 
and also making summaries. You know, today we can do summaries quite well in using uh, the latest technology. Uh, and summary is something you know, every agent has to wrap up a call at the end of the call. It takes time. Uh, uh, that means money for the company. So they, they, the summary can be generated automatically for the agent to review and correct when it's the case. Others, other uh, applications analyze the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of calls that the company gets uh, gets uh, every day. Uh, companies, especially big enterprises, don't even know what the agents talk about. I want to know what the customer is asking about. Are there new trends, mm -hmm. new problems arising? So if you can do that automatically, it's a big, big uh, uh, improvement of the customer care situation uh, for, for, for a company. And also there are other applications that we are working on, like support for sales, emotional uh, emotion detection in a sales call to understand what is the sentiment of the, of the, of the, of the clients and provide, so provide hints to the salesperson or when seeing that the clients are not engaged and so on. So there are a lot of applications, which is not just the, the horrible voice of VR, like people, people, you, if you remember at the time, there was a website, I want human.com that tells, the, we used to tell the tricks, like, uh, for instance, if you call the AT&T, you get an automated machine, put zero three times, turn on, turn back, five times, say the magic words, and then operator will come, right? Yeah, so, so <laughs> actually it was a serious thing. It was a serious thing. Yeah, yeah. that's a, yeah. I can, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I, I think um, it's clear that, I mean, that, that's a, a really good explanation of the value proposition commercially, but also that uh, from a user perspective, it acts it these days it's not something that pe people aren't going to go and look at a site like that anymore because they're quite satisfied with what they get yeah. Yeah. from the interactions and um and perhaps would choose it um over a human in in some situations because they don't have to engage they don't have to um do small talk they can just move right along uh, Okay, in 2012, you framed AI as language, thought, understanding, solving communication problems with elegant mathematical solutions. And I'm interested in that, the elegant mathematical solutions part of this. Um, is that still how you view it today? Uh, in, in terms of advances in machine learning and AI, does it actually still boil down to solving communication problems with elegant mathematical solutions, or is it now something different? Yeah, that's a very, very, very good question that gets into epistemology and philosophy. And I could talk for, I would love to talk for hours with you in front of a good uh, Australian uh, red wine. Yeah. <laughs> we can arrange that. <laughs> we can do that next time. But uh, that's, that's very interesting. I've, I've been very fortunate to live through the evolution of AI or machine learning, like we use it, until today. And uh, when I say that, I was referring in particular to uh, speech recognition or ASR, mm -hmm. and people call it, because ASR was, it was not invented because ASR, the people started to, to try to find solution to ASR, at least as far as we know, in the 1950s, using analog computer, and not, not everything analog machine, with register and capacitors and, and, and tubes, right? But in the 1970s, uh, the work uh, done at IBM Research by Fred Jelinek and Jim Baker, they came up with an elegant mathematical formulation of the problem of speech recognition. And it's the only equation that I have in my book, which is the question that everyone who works in speech recognition should at least know that puts out the problem, uh, uh, solving the problem of speech recognition and solving the problem of the optimal receiver in presence of noise. Right? We have thoughts, we express our thoughts with words, the words get into a noisy, and the noise is also the different variations that we use to, to talk, different dialects and so on. And then it gets to the end, to, your, to the ear of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, of a listener, and then you can express it mathematically. And the noise, you want to get the best possible sequence of words given a noise. And the equation highlights 
two important things that have been with us until I would say 10 years ago, and this the acoustic model and the language model. So we knew language models way before language, large language models came to the new language models since then, then the end of the 1940s with Claude Shannon talking about that in his famous seminar paper on information theory. So, so what happened? What happened today? So if you look about what happened today, I would like to cite uh, one of my philosopher heroes is Daniel Dennett, uh, who wrote in a recent book that go, and it makes the, the, uh, the, uh, the parallel between uh, the evolution theory, Darwin, Darwinism, and the uh, uh, Alan Turing in the Turing machine. So the evolution theory taught us that you can build complex, sophisticated organisms without comprehension. We don't, you, the evolution theory does not understand as a virus, a frog, or a human being work. But that happens to an algorithm that is the survival of the future. So many variations of that, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it talk about competence without comprehension. Uh, Alan Turing showed a very simple machine can solve all the problem. Of course, it's a, it's a, it's a virtual uh, theoretical machine. And today we have large language models. Language, uh, large language models don't have the modules inside. They take uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the speech, they, 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 talking about natural language understanding, take this, the string of words, find the adjectives, find the nouns, find the verbs, makes up uh, an hypothesis about, there's nothing of that. It's just a, a mass of uh, artificial neurons that have been trained on so much text that and they've been training only to predict the next word. And it's amazing how pre just predicting the next word or the next token, you can, they have a behavior that seems like intelligent. Uh, uh, I say seems because I don't believe it's totally intelligent and many people, but uh, it, 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 it demonstrates some rationality and some intelligence and makes a lot of mistakes sometimes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, it's competence without comprehension. The individual artificial neurons inside the machine don't understand anything, don't have comprehension of anything. But the mass of things like the, the, the neurons in our brain eventually get to a competence level. Um, so does that suggest that there's an absence of design in this at this point as well? So I like to talk about Chat GPT and large language model. Large language model is not just Chat, Chat GPT. When I was at Google, I was working on Lambda and Mina and the evolution of large language model today uh, came to Bard and Gemini. Uh, I like to, to say about the, the history of AI, like the end of the intelligent designer. So there's no intelligent design. It's not totally true. In order to design a chat GPT, there is a lot of engineering, engineering behind there, right? And the same for all language. But we don't design modules, we don't design algorithms, we don't design what we used to do a mere 12, 13 years ago, right? So. Right. So, I mean, yeah. So there, there is a, a very large phase, perhaps the largest phase, in which there is an absence of design. Yes, yes, yeah. And see, we, we need to. We are the beginning of that in these two phases. It's what I call actually the democratization of AI, right? Many mm -hmm. people call it that because everyone can use ChatGPT to create interesting application, even if you know, don't have studied natural language understanding, speech recognition, and so on, right? Yeah. That's great. Um, which is a nice lead into the next question I have here. So you noted that. Uh, unsupervised learning is the holy grail for speech recognition. Um, I think it's safe to say that this is today perhaps the holy grail across the entirety of AI and machine learning. To what extent do you think it's possible and practical to achieve this holy grail? Um, is there a limit that you think it might be impossible to cross? I think we have to cross the limit. There is no so if you want to to build machines that are more and more competent, we need to be able to train them more and more data and more and more multi-models. They're not just text. The limit of today's line, large language models that they 
they have seen only text. Imagine a brain in the vat, so only read the web, never touched uh, a, a, a cold surface, it never tasted the taste of a lemon, and so on, right? So uh, it, it, there is a limitation to that, right? Uh, so we need, because we cannot use what we used to do before annotations, right? Annotate curated data. Mm-hmm. We need to curate the data in way to uh, avoid uh, avoid uh, redundancy, remove duplication, clean up data from a lot of things. But that can be done programmatically. So uh, when I started speech recognition in the 1980s, we had to record words and make sure that they were the word that, that were tagged and so on. And we don't mm-hmm. we cannot do that anymore. Also, there is a more strict uh guidelines of say of uh of privacy uh i cannot use recordings uh freely right i cannot right and then in fact we need to think about how and you know large language models are trained mostly in a supervised manner they learn how to predict the next token so it's easy to take text and mask remove the next one once at a time remove the next token and ask the, the large language model to, to predict it. So uh, I, that's one thing. The other thing is that we see more and more uh, a generation of synthetic data that is helping. That happened a few years ago with speech recognition. So we can generate data. We know how to generate speech. We can generate and perturb between noise and variations and so on. So this is the, uh, the new world. And, uh, and this is, what we need to is that the problem so now we have seen a lot of use of, of the human in the loop in what is called uh reinforcing learning with human feedback uh that's very useful but it happens on your on a limited amount of, of this you want to make sure and that's useful for many things like uh, working on hallucinations uh bias and safety and so so which i still see that but it's not the, the big majority of the big amount of data is, is going to be unsupervised. Uh, My next question does dig a little bit deeper into that. So yeah. um, over recent decades, the volumes of data used have increased massively. And you've expressed concerns about how this impacts scalability. So um, I'll just read a fairly lengthy quote here, and then there's a few questions. So. What plays a big role in the more difficult attainment of human-like performance in language, understanding, and generation is that even today, we still need to rely on representations of meaning such as intents and arguments, which are not naturally available to us. And these need to be crafted on a case-by-case basis. And crafting an abstract representation requires a lot of work that hardly scales to cover all possible meanings and their variations. Now, I'm sure at the time that you wrote that, um, made a lot of sense. Uh, What's happened in the time since then has probably um, obviated that even further. Um, So do you see a near-term solution to this scaling problem? Do you think that those case-by-case crafting that you talked about, that that can be automated. But if it is automated, um, does the issue of getting human-like performance extend to some of the bigger issues, such as hallucination and uh, elimination or management of bias? And can this be achieved without human in the loop? That's a great set of questions. Let me start saying that, uh, in my opinion, and this, of course, all of this, in my opinion. Uh, mm-hmm. Anytime we tried to impose a human-invented uh, uh, a representation on a machine, on a language machine, speech machine, on a natural language understand, we didn't get great results. And a clear example is speech recognition. Until, I would say, 12, 15 years ago, we imposed the phonetic transcription. And we... We couldn't get above a certain uh, why. This is a phonemes, you know, to a certain extent, and I know I will attract the irate responses of linguists. Uh, it's a human invention. If, if you're going to uh, take someone in the street, say, can you tell me what are the phonemes? People don't know. We know the words, 
and we know how to pronounce them, but not in the between, right? So, and in fact, today's speech recognition does not need to have a phonetic transcription. It, it creates its own phonetic theory, which is very amazing, uh, right? One of the layers, yeah, or the many layers, so that uh, we'll have something which uh, not exactly correspond. Uh, by the way, linguists fight, right, about what is the correct representation of phonemes and so on, right? Now, the same thing with intent. Intents uh, are a human invention. It's, 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 the human invention, the human invention of intents, especially for uh, for uh, uh, virtual assistant, is very important, necessary. Why? Because eventually, if you ask a human, a virtual assistant to do something, it has to call a, a function, the API, what we call the API, the the function that defines a functionality. If I say, "What's the weather tomorrow in uh, in Sydney?" Uh, Eventually, once I understand this, I had to create a, a, an HTTP request to the weather.com uh, site and get the response and interpret the response, right? So, so we all create an intermediate because it could be weather.com or it could be another site, intermediate representation that is, that is weather, open par- weather, open parenthesis, Sydney, uh, comma, tomorrow, close parenthesis, right? But now, that creates a scaling problem, right? The API exists already because people with this website, they will create an API, they will need an API for everyone to be able to query that, that thing. And then we want to create an idea and, and that the, requires uh, a lot of people, a lot of engineers defining these intents and arguments or entities, uh, how we used to call them. Now, if you look at uh, things that, uh, you know, Bard, the Gemini, and Chad GPT, they don't have intents. Why? Because they're able to provide the answer to a question exact without going to an intermediate phase. Now, the problem, if I ask what's the weather in Sydney, they don't know that because they were trained three months ago, six months ago, and they may knew what the weather of Sydney was, but it's not of use to us, right? So there are, somehow they have to know the API, what we call the API or the, the function call and how to invoke it. And then I see we are moving in a direction where with uh, GPTs and uh, agents and so on, we can do that by providing to the to the, to the the chatbot or to the uh, large engine model, the knowledge of the API development without designing and engineering an intermediate representation. So I think there is a a hope, and I think probably as this, the world is moving so fast right now that many of the things we do today don't require the design of an intent and argument. Uh, so, uh, an intent and argument schema, right? Yeah, that's, that's mm-hmm. so. And and therefore, the human in the loop can be uh, taken out. No, the human in the loop, as I said in one of my previous answer. It's still to validate. You you mentioned hallucinations. You mentioned safety. Safety is an important uh, 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 problem, right? What we call the alignment problem, aligning the values of of of, of AI to the values of humans, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, like safety bias, fairness, uh, and so on, right? We don't want a a chat bot like chat GPT or any chat to be abusive, to have abusive language. And we don't want them to, to uh, give uh, advice uh, on how to do violent things, uh, to, to build bombs or to kill people, right? Or simply advise on health, right? Because I have a headache, what should I do? They should not, they should tell you, go to a doctor. <laughs> I'm, not, mm-hmm. I'm not allowed to give you health, I think, right? And but they do that. So, all these things which are, go under the uh, the umbrella of responsible AI and safety and trust, uh, uh, they still require some form of human in the loop. And I'm saying that uh, we, we could have like uh, uh, quality assurance loops where the subhumans interact and say, oh, this is not a very safe. It's an abusive answer. I mark it, right, as abusive, right? And, and so, so, uh, and I believe, and I probably see some article where we start doing that automatically, 
Yeah, I imagine we have a much more uh, expert uh, uh, language model that is expert exact on safety issues that could actually correct, teach the other model. This is not very good to do, oh, yeah. but this is still a, a big research issue and a lot of problem. Yeah. Okay, well, I have just one last question. Um, and that question is, if you were running the interview and not me, what is the question that you would ask yourself? Is there something uh, really important that I've forgotten to ask? Ah, uh, <laughs> that's interesting. You asked exactly the questions that I would ask myself because probably you are, you, know, you read the books. Thank you for reading my books. Uh, I enjoyed and, them. Thank you. And you got to know me and you got to know my 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 interest and my 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 point the points that I was trying to make there I don't have a, a specific question to ask myself I know probably uh the question is what will happen in the next five years uh and the answer is somewhat that some of the some great scientists gave uh making prediction is very hard especially ahead of time so, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, who could predict the uh charge of it here? You know, 20 years ago, 20 years, no one did, right? Yeah, you know, and uh, to be prepared, right? I, yeah. Sorry, my go wife ahead. And I often sit down and uh and say, yeah, talk about could we have predicted where we are today if we looked just two years ago? Uh, and usually the answer is. Across a lot of big things, there's there's something that uh, that we would never have imagined. Uh, how it, places our it, lives have gone. It's interesting. We had a, a New Year's Eve party with some friends here, and I ran a game that I've done in other in other parts to say, let's predict what will happen at the end of this 2024, and let's meet again at the end of 2024. I wrote down the predictions actually. Let's see, ah. and, and the predictions were about political uh, status uh, about the, uh, the uh, AI and all this type of thing, economy and stuff like that. We'll see, we'll see how wow. good, but uh, who could predict COVID and I, I, how Mel Brooks would say, who could uh, expect uh, the Spanish Inquisition? Spanish right? Inquisition. Yes. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no one did expect that, right? Yeah. So. Well, Roberto, uh, can't thank you enough for your time and your um, patient and insightful responses to the questions. Uh, it was really great to um, spend this time together and to dig a little bit deeper into things that I think uh, are really the important topics in our industry today. So uh, no. huge thank you. Thank you so much, Phil. I know that we have been... Uh dating for some time before we actually <laughs> <laughs> it took like probably something a couple of years ago and you know, I, I changed job and all these type of things but uh, it's great i really enjoyed uh thanks a lot for the great questions uh next podcast we do it in front of a good uh glass of pinot noir from from the from some of the great wineries in in australia or in italy yeah so uh, they're both great suggestions, and uh, perhaps we can talk about art and photography in the next session. That would be great. Thank you, Phil. Thanks again, Roberto. Take care.